You are now tuned into the Miami Man Cave Show with your hosts, Jeff Fox, breaking down all of today's sports news and breaking the internet live from Miami and brought to you by Remix Sports Media. Roy Hibbert looks worse than Kwame Brown. I, oh boy. That's I can't believe yes, it that I'm saying that. You went through a couple of years struggling big time before ultimately Phil came back and then you got Paul Gasol in that trade for Kwame Brown. You trying to tell me that you don't know a scrub when you see a scrub? Who is on crack? <laughs> I do not love. What? I do not what? love. What? I do what? not what love. What is wrong with my you? Point. He was not in a truck. See, you don't know basketball. You just got caught. You just got caught. It's official. <laughs> Tristan Thompson got me thinking about the damn Kardashians. Something ain't right. Oh, okay. Put Back the camera up, on me. Turn on the lights. Yo, fam. What's up, man? Good to see you, baby. It's good, man. Good, man. I can't complain. You made it. I made it. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. What's going on, man? No doubt. Welcome, welcome to the man cave. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you made it, man. I'm in the house. What's going on? I'm I'm good, good, man. Good, Good, man. How's life treating you? Great, great. Start a new company, of course. Remix Sports Media. Right. You know, we doing our thing. We got the book. Oh, You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, this is like a family reunion, man. Yeah. It's like family reunion, man. You know, we go way back. back. Yeah, we go way back, man. You have always been good to me. Yes, sir. Uh, I always appreciate it. Real proud of you and what you've been doing. Jealous that you're down here in Miami and I'm not, <laughs> uh, but that's a different subject for another day. I'm here now. Yeah, that's all that matters. Yeah, folks down here in Miami, by the way, welcome to the Miami Man Cave. My main man here, Stephen A. Smith, and of course, the biggest voice man in America when it comes to sports media. Right. And you know what? It wasn't always like this. It wasn't always like this, but you, you never, you never quit, man. You're well, an inspiration to a lot. I don't, of us. I don't, I don't. I appreciate that, and I do try to be an inspiration. But I never look at myself as, you know, number one or, or whatever. I mean, the numbers show it in terms of the ratings on television, social media impact, that kind of thing. But it's it's almost like when I give speeches, I always say this: I know I'm number one because I know I'm not. And my attitude is, I got to put my head down and be on my grind every single day. Uh, because when you're us, nothing's given to you, nothing's handed to you, and even the stuff that you end up getting, you can lose at the snap of a finger. I know what that's like. And, yeah. You know, I live my life, and maybe it's not the healthiest way to live it, but there's a healthy fear that comes with it. It's not something that I express. It's not something that I talk too often about, uh, whether it's with my family or loved ones or in a circle, but I remember what it's like to lose everything. I remember what it's like to be at the top of the heat and literally in a flash, it was all gone. Yeah. Um, and when it was gone, nobody called me. Nobody wanted to interview me. Nobody wanted to hire me. Um, they thought I was finished. And to be quite honest with you, if I'm being totally honest, I thought I was finished at times. And so to have those experiences as a backdrop, there isn't a day that goes by, and I mean not a single day that goes by, that I don't have some level of recollection of what those moments were like when I was a new father, um, I was unemployed, um, I didn't, I, I was running out of money, wondering how on earth I was going to be able to provide for my family and myself. Yes. And so when you come from the background that I come from and you have those kind of experiences, to be quite honest with you, you don't have time to sit around and go like this, I'm the man, I'm number one and all of this other stuff because you know it could be gone in a flash, particularly when it comes to us. But you know what? You walk with a swagger. Mm-hmm. You, you, you just have that demeanor about you now. I know that, that it hasn't always been this way, but you, you wear that on your shoulders. You just walk in with confidence. Well, you know I, I walk in, I, to me, to, to a lot of people, it looks like I got this swag and I walk a certain way. I've always walked that way. Yeah. I mean, I didn't change anything because I became successful. I had a little money. I, the walk that I have is the walk that I've always had, right. to my knowledge. You know, that's like somebody saying that Denzel's gait is something that he developed once he won an Oscar. Right. No, he was walking that way before he won an Oscar. I was walking this way before I had the number one show for 11 and a half consecutive years. All of those things are things that uh, other people think about, but I don't think about it. It's just that for me, you know, listen, I got left back in the fourth grade with a first grade reading level. 
I was called an affirmative action hire when I first got hired in this business. In high school, when I wanted to go to college, I was literally laughed at by my guidance counselor. I've been doubted all my life. And so for me, the walk, the, the confidence that I supposedly exude, to me it's not confidence necessarily, it's me saying, I'm going to keep marching forward. I'm not going to be stopped. You're going to have to kill me to stop me. That's what I'm saying. It's not so much acting like I've arrived. It's, it's really recognizing the fact that I know I have to keep going, that I can't stop, right. and I'm not going to stop. You're going to have to stop me. Right. If my walk says anything, it says that. You're going to have to take me out. I'm not going to take myself out. This book, Straight Shooter. Yeah. We talked about it a long time, yeah. and um, this didn't come out, by the way, until uh, yeah, you yeah. lost tragically your mom. Yeah, and you you talk about it a lot in this book mm -hmm. and what she's meant to you, and she was there for you in the beginning we when were things were weren't exactly rolling. People think, Stephen A, that that people think that you're all what you're hot, you know, whatever you touch turns to gold, but. Humble beginnings, man. Well, and I don't. I appreciate that. I don't really give a damn what people think mm -hmm. about me that don't know me. Um, right. You know, I've often said this, and I'll say this until the day that I die. There's none of us that are perfect. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of imperfections about myself that I can point to, but I'll put my character up against anybody. Um, I don't walk around intentionally trying to hurt people. I'm not somebody that wishes evil or bad upon other people. I don't sit up there and look at my success and want you to fail as, as a method or a mode of me big up in myself. I don't want to be better than somebody who doesn't succeed. I want everybody to succeed. I just want to be better than everybody else. I want to be the best that I can be while other people are successful. So we're all enjoying the fruits of our labor. I think that con contributes to less animosity and less vitriol existing. But as it pertains to my mother, my mother is the greatest woman I've ever known, uh, if not the greatest human being that I've known. Um, when I think about God and the kind of impact that the good Lord has had on my life, the evidence is the mother that the Lord provided me with. Yeah. Because when I think about my mother and what she had to endure, the trials and tribulations, the sacrifices that she had to make, I don't put it, I mean, I tried to highlight it to some degree, but even in my book, I don't think that anything can crystallize how much my mother suffered, how much she sacrificed, how much she put up with, how much she was willing to take and absorb just to make sure we were okay. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I look at it from that perspective, anything that's positive about my life is a testament to her because if it were not for her, there's no way on earth that I would have gotten to where I am. And she always believed in me. She always believed in my potential. But more importantly, she made sure that there was a character that came along with it that had a level of compassion um, and empathy for those who are less fortunate than ourselves and to make sure that while I'm doing what I'm doing, I, up, I help to uplift as many people along the way as I possibly can. And that's, to be honest with you, is where some of my fearlessness comes from. Because when I'm marching about the business of doing my job, I don't believe I'm doing it just for me. I'm a black man in this position. And somehow, some way, if I do it and I do it right, imagine how many doors that's going to open for other people. So I go from being a talent on a show where there was no diversity to making sure diversity was on that show. And that show ultimately gets to number one and it stays to number one. And then ultimately I become the executive producer of that show. And then all of a sudden you're seeing black women, black men, white women, white men. You're seeing a diverse mosaic of contributors to a show that's been number one in the morning for 11 and a half years. I hold on to that as a badge of honor. So it's not just about first take success. It's about Ryan Clark's success on the pivot. It's about Marcus Spears getting a new contract covering the NFL. It's about Dan Orlovsky doing some Monday night football games. It's about Lewis Riddick doing the same. No it's blues. about Kimberly Martin covering yeah. the NFL for ESPN. It's about Mina Kimes getting a new contract. It's about Bart Scott getting ready to call some NBA games. I'm sorry, NFL games and stuff like that. All of those things in its own way has a level of attachment to me, even with Skip Bayless. Yeah, he brought me the first take, but 
he went from making high, you know, six figures to seven figures mm -hmm. and making tens of millions of dollars. He doesn't pull that off if we're not successful on first take. Right. He doesn't pull that off if that doesn't happen. And so my contribution to so many people in the industry, you know, and, you know, ultimately is what I lean back on with a level of pride because along the way, while produ producing and achieving stuff for myself, I made sure to look out for others on the way up. And that's what it's all about. And guess what? I'm going to do it on the way down, too, because everybody falls at some point. No doubt, the Notorious Big had that song, they pray and pray for my downfall, yeah. you know, your Brooklyn homie, so yeah. it is what it is. I remember the day you talked, well, actually you've talked about it many times before, mm -hmm. where the day you got that big check, your first check, and you went to your mom's job. Yep. Talk about that for a minute. That was a contract, I uh, signed a contract uh, to do the show, quite frankly, which was on ESPN2 in 2005. Um, and the show started in August of 2005, but we had negotiated the deal in April of 2005. And the proudest moment of my life was when I signed that contract because I signed it at about 3 or 3.30 in the afternoon. I was on 66th and Columbus, uh, Columbus Avenue in the ABC building, and I signed it there. And then I immediately drove to Hollis, Queens, New York, and I went to the PAL, Police Athletic League Center, where my mother had retired as a nurse. Right. Uh, but she was there, you know, running their, uh, you know, running their after school program and stuff like that and bingo and all of this stuff was going on. And I walked up in there and I grabbed and I looked at her boss and I said, she won't be back. And I told my mother, your days of working are over. It was the one dream that I had my entire life. And the only thing that I regret is that an even bigger contract would come years later, but unfortunately it would come a year after she passed away uh, because she passed away in 2017 and 2018 was when I had, when I got the you know, latest contract with ESPN and that amount of money would have afforded me the ability to build her house yeah. in St. Thomas. Yeah. And that was what I really, really wanted to do. So that's the long regret that I have that I wasn't able to achieve even more a bit earlier because then I would have showered her with a lot of things. A lot of things that I have now, I wouldn't have myself because I would have deprived myself of all of it yeah. just to make sure that I set her up because there's no woman alive that ever deserved, there's no woman on this planet that I've ever known that's ever deserved more than my mother. And I would have sacrificed any comfort, anything that I could have done just to make sure she lived in a laugh of luxury because she deserved it. No doubt. Jeff Fox here in the Miami Man Cave. The book is called Straight Shooter. My dad says he's a straight shooter. Big fan of yours, by the way. Well, thank you, Tony. And I, I want to thank you for you know acknowledging him a couple of years ago when you were down here yeah. in the 305. Miami loves you. Believe it or not, and you I, I, love I, I, Miami. I, I, I don't think that's hard. That's far fetched. I know Miami. Yeah, loves yeah. You. They, because, I mean, because come I, mean, on, I man. mean, the love that I have for this city. <laughs> I mean, my lord. You know, in a perfect world, I'll be down here. Yeah. You know, in a perfect world, but it, it'll happen when it's meant to be. No doubt. Uh, talk about what's going on in the 305 right now. Uh, with with this Heat basketball team, with the Florida Panthers, and now Messi. I mean, it does. Is, is there some kind of synergy going on? Have well, you ever course. seen this? Oh, look, man, it's Miami, bro. I mean, <laughs> it's the warm weather, it's the palm trees, it's the sunshine, it's no state income taxes. You get to keep more of your money. Uh, the women are just drop dead gorgeous. Yes, I'm saying it. Yes, I sir. Know what anybody else feels? I know what I feel. <laughs> Um, the, this, the quality of life is second to none as far as I'm concerned. Miami is where it's at, there's no doubt about that, but um, a lot of props goes to the sports franchises down here. The Miami Dolphins are relevant, the Florida Panthers are relevant, the Heat are obviously relevant playing right now in the NBA Finals, got to give them some love where it's due. Nobody's been to more Finals 2006 than the Miami Heat, so you take all of those things into consideration, you appreciate it for what it's worth, um, but in the end, you know, when you think about life and you think about smelling your roses and enjoying the fruits of your labor, when you go outside in Miami, that just says it all. I think the other day really epitomized it more than ever. It was pouring raining yep. in Miami the other day while the sun was shining. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, think about that for a second. I think people don't realize that. Usually it's, it, when it's raining, you can't even look up. If you look right. up to the sky, it's dark gray and stuff like that. I don't care where it is. It could be New York, it could be LA, it could be Chicago, it could be anywhere. It's very, very rare where you're in a place 
where it's pouring raining while the sun is shining. Yeah. That's what happened in Miami. It was so that it was that way. It was so fly in Miami the other day. It was raining and it didn't even phase me. Yeah. I just looked up. I said, the sun is still shining. Just beautiful. Yeah. Just absolutely beautiful. I think the only person that wants to be here more than me is my bodyguard who's Dominican. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, outside of him, I don't think there's anybody that wants yeah. to be here more than me. Big shout to him, by the way, man. That's a cool brother right yeah, there. Yeah, he's good. You know, man. no doubt. So we love the 305. They love you here as well. You're always doing that. I'm going to South Beach, baby. They, we love when you do that. I mean, it's that, free that, publicity. That, 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 you deserve a key well, to the city, they bro. They did give me a key to the city. Oh, they okay, did give okay. Me a key to the city. They gave me a key to the city years ago. I still have that key, nope. and I don't give a damn who's in office and who's not in office. The key belongs to me. Um, there's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but uh, again, I love Miami. I love the people. Uh, the only hard part about Miami is that it makes me ashamed that I never learned Spanish. But I blame my bodyguard as much as myself because he's never really taken the time to teach it to me. It's like he wants to hold on yeah. to the language, and he doesn't want you. You know, you, 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 you know, you're not one of us. <laughs> I love you, boss, but you're not one of us. That's his way of saying it. Right. And I got to just live with him. You know, I got to live with it. You know, I understand how it goes. He loves me. I love him back. He's like a brother to me. But you know, it, it is what it is. He he could have taught me some Spanish, but I also think he did it to save me because if I knew how to speak Spanish better, Lord I might have got myself in more trouble over the years. So yeah. he was actually looking at. Yeah. He was actually looking at. <laughs> but you know, I'm cool now. Life is a bit more settled, so and nobody has anything to worry about in that regard. Are you ever satisfied? With what? With your success, bro. Mm, no. Um, when you've got two daughters, when you've got four older sisters who suffer just as much as you, when you've got 15 nieces and nephews, about seven or eight to which you are daddy to because you're the only god father figure they've ever really had. Um, when you have that kind of stuff going on in your life, that's one thing. But then when you take into account the times that we're living in, the way times are changing, the fact that diversity is still an issue, uh, that you know people are still viewing life and they're looking at the challenges that we face as a society and they're saying to themselves, you know what, hey, there's so many things to overcome. No matter how far we climb, we're still reminded about how far we need to go. As a whole, as a society, it's not just black people going and it's my Latino brothers and sisters that are going through that as well. Or my Hispanic brothers and sisters, we understand that. And you know, for me to be in the position that I'm in, to have the impact that I have, um, it's never truly, truly satisfying because you're always reminded about how much more there is to do, yeah. to make a difference, to have an impact. Uh, to, 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 to provoke and create change. And so if, if it's just about money and it's just about success, yeah, I'm good. I, I've achieved a lot. But that's never what it was about for me. I've always been called the rebel with a cause. And my mentality has always been, what can I do to, to, to make a difference in a very, very positive way? And that is a never ending journey. I understand that. And so satisfaction really isn't a part of the equation. That's just the way that it goes. And everybody ain't built for it, but I am. Mm. I remember Stephen A um, years ago when I was on ESPN radio, 790 down here. And uh, you came on our show yeah. and you broke some news. Uh, the news that you broke was that LeBron James was coming to the Miami Heat. And everybody in America jumped down your throat. Yeah. How the hell does he know that? Who the fuck does he think he is? Right. Talk mad shit about you. Yeah. How do you handle all that criticism? Because you were right. And I said, you know what? You proved yourself to be right. I would never doubt that brother again. Well, one of the problems that we have, particularly as black folks that are in our position, is that people are quick to ignore our resume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got let go from ESPN. But I'm the same Stephen A that had been covering the NBA since 1996. Right. So after 14 years on the beat, you're going to think I just made something up. You know better. Yeah. You know better. They knew better. And the reason why they took that position was not because they thought I was wrong. It's because they were hoping I was wrong. Oh, yeah. Because if I were wrong, then that would justify their ridicule and their venom and their hostility. And we get that. And so what happens is sometimes, you know, and I'm famous for this, and my mother used to actually get on me about this because she did not like this quality about me. 
She loved the fact that I was patient, but she hated the fact that I used patience for bad. And what I mean by that is that I have no problem sitting back and watching somebody get exposed. Right. In other words, instead of being in everybody's face telling you this person ain't shit, this person ain't worth a damn, this person is blah, 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 blah. I like sitting back and say, watch, you'll see. And mom will be like, why do you do that? Right. Why do you have to do that? Let that go. <laughs> you know, she'll be like that. You're wishing it's bad karma. You're wishing it upon somebody else. And I say, no, I'm not wishing it. Yes. I'm telling you what they are. They're just going to expose themselves. And a lot of times in our society, you'd be surprised how much we stress ourselves because we're anxious to put on display someone's character or lack thereof when all we have to do is wait. Yeah. Be patient. It's almost like when I talk about the Cowboys, mm -hmm. all right, in a very innocuous kind of way compared to the subject that we're talking about. I tell a Cowboy, I tell everybody out there about the Cowboys, be patient, just wait. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> you the always say that. Don't, don't, yeah. don't, don't, don't relax. Relax. I know they're winning a few games right now. They look like a juggernaut. Right. Don't worry about it. When the lights get brightest and when the moment arrives, they will fold. Yeah. Right. In a more serious way, you have some people who remain nameless, that just ain't worth shit. Yeah. And all you have to do is wait. Just wait for it. And when you're a person of character and you know that you think better than that and you're decent and more humane than those kinds of folks, you just wait. Yeah. Don't stress yourself trying to push it and forcing them to be exposed because then you're getting yourself caught up in a level of negativity that will serve to bring you down. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is be patient. Yeah. They will expose themselves. And I haven't, I haven't been wrong about that. No doubt. The great Stephen A. Smith here in the Miami Man Cave. You're giving it to us raw right now. And uh, I want to talk about your relationships because that's a big part of what you, are, what you do and who you are. You seem so real with it. I mean, you've been in, in Philly with Allen Iverson yeah. since back in the day, Philadelphia Daily News. Right. Philadelphia Inquirer, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Philadelphia Inquirer. Who is your closest... NBA relationship, and I'm going to take a guess. Mm -hmm. I, I think, think it's Shaquille O'Neal. Probably. Um, Shaquille and I are brothers. We're very, very tight. Um, but you got a lot of them now. I got you always say that. Well, we've been, you know, Allen Iverson and I, it's very hard to compete with that because yeah. we've been through a lot together. Yes. Shaquille O'Neal is pretty much me just being a brother to him and him being a brother to me, but he's been through a lot. Mm -hmm. And Allen Iverson, in my case, we've been through a lot together. Um, but Shaquille O'Neal is one of the best human beings I've ever known. Um, he's a really, really good brother. Um, Kobe and I were a lot tighter than people realized. And it wasn't something that you exposed when he was alive because Kobe's a very private individual, and I'm certainly not going to get into it now, but we were very, very tight. Right. And we talked a lot. And we talked about a lot of different things that extended beyond the court of basketball. And so, you know, him, D. Wade, and a few others, just the level of love and respect. Just spoke to D. Wade the other day, man. Just so proud of that brother and all the things that he's doing. And one of the best human beings I've ever encountered. And D. Wade's heart's always in the right place. Um, but you're right. There's a lot of relationships that I have. There's a few relationships I don't have and have no desire to have mm -hmm. uh, because... You know, I'm not going to say that I don't have love for anybody who don't have love for me, but I will say I don't have use for anybody who don't have love for me. I ain't going to lose sleep over them. And so, you know, you just march on and you march forward and you just be the best human being that you could possibly be. Very proud of you, man, because, you know, you are very transparent in this book. I encourage everybody to get the book. It's called Straight Shooter, you know, a uh, memoir of second chances and first takes. Yeah. You open up, you know, and you shared some of your lowest lows and your highs, highs and triumphs and all of that. Yeah. But you just launched a new podcast. Yeah. I want you to talk about that because since I've known you, I've known you to be more than just a sports guy. You yeah. always want to talk about politics mm -hmm. and, and just a variety of stuff. Well, Why the podcast? Well, first of all, I own it. Um, I'm not an employee. It's not under the ESPN umbrella. I own it. I operate it. It's my masters. It's my RSS feed. It's all of that. It's all mine. Um, that was incredibly important to me. In order to do that, 
because I'm working for ESPN, it couldn't be just sports because if it was just sports, why deviate, for, why, why veer away from right. the worldwide leader? And so that's why you see me talking about stuff beyond the world of sports, even though I'm still going to talk my sports. Um, it was originally entitled No Mercy. I changed the name to the Stephen A. Smith Show. Uh, because I plan on it not just being a podcast, but an actual show. Mm. Um, one that's suitable for linear television, not just streaming on YouTube or anywhere else. Um, and I'm going to do that. And it's important to me because I wanted a platform that I own and operate where I'm the, I, the buck stops with me, where I answer to no one but myself, uh, because I wanted to adopt more of an entrepreneurial spirit. A lot of times when we're out here doing our thing, we're on our grind, particularly with a West Indian mother like myself, God rest her soul. It was about punching that clock, showing up to work every day, doing your job, going home, ultimately relying on your savings and a pension. That wasn't enough for me. Um, I wanted to build my own content. I wanted to show my chops as an executive producer and an entrepreneur. And more importantly than that, um, I just wanted to have a level of control and to be and to display a willingness to do what a lot of younger folks have inspired me to do, and that was to bet on myself. Uh, so many times we take a safety net. You know, you yes. get older, you got a mortgage, you got children, you got family members, etc. You want to go that safe route. For me, it was important to really, really um, just show that I'm not scared anymore. Um, I've accomplished a lot in my life. At some point in time, you got to be able to close your eyes and sleep at night with the mentality and the thought process of, I'm betting on me. Right. I'm believing in myself. I'm asking people to bet on me, to invest in me, to believe in me. Well, why the hell am I not doing that for myself? And I just got to a point where it was no longer uh, acceptable to me right. uh, to doubt myself to worry about failure or whatever. I didn't get to where I am by worrying about those things and avoiding challenges. I got to where I am by recognizing those things and willing to embrace and accept the challenges. And when it came to being an entrepreneur, that's where it fell short. I didn't do it. Right. And I just got to a point where I'm like, enough's enough. I'm going to go for this and, and I'm going to win. And that's what I'm determined to do. Hey, man, I just want to thank you for spending time with us, man, for making time with us. Here at Remix Sports Media, uh, the Miami Man Cave here yeah. in the 305, man. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate, Appreciate you. you. Proud of you. The book, Straight Shooter. Make sure you get it. It's available everywhere. Proud moment for us right here in the Miami. <laughs>